Okay, members, we'll uh, commence the meeting. So, okay, member. uh, members, we're very welcome to this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on the COVID-19 response. First item on the, well, the agenda item is the minutes, first of all, of proceedings of the previous meeting held on the 6th of January. Members are asked to note these minutes, which are p- at page three of your packs and which I have already agreed. So, members should also note that the minutes of evidence from that meeting have been published in the official report available on the committee's web page. Item two uh, is the updated guidance for members on the procedures of this ad hoc committee. A copy of the updated guidance is included in your packs at page seven. And I've updated this guidance to clarify that members may also participate remotely in its proceedings. Gen item three then is a minister statement from the Minister of Education, and uh, I have received notification on Tuesday that the Minister wishes to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to make is included in your pack at page 14. I would like to welcome the Minister of Education to this meeting of the Committee, and I now invite the Minister to make a statement which should be heard by members without any interruptions. Following the statement, there will be an opportunity for members, therefore, to ask questions. And, uh, I call the minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to start by commending our school leaders, teachers, school staff, and parents for their ongoing commitment to the education of our children and young people in these challenging circumstances. While schools, parents, and carers have worked together to support remote learning, most would agree that our pupils are best served through face-to-face school-based learning. That is not simply about just their education, but also mm. the mental health social development and well-being of children throughout Northern Ireland. That is why the decision of the Executive on Tuesday is so significant. We have collectively stated as an Executive that reopening schools for all pupils is an Executive priority as we strive to protect the education, health and well-being of our young people. Our decisions to date have seen preschool pupils and primaries 1 to 3 return to school on the 8th of March and years 12 to 14 are due to return to classroom from the 22nd of March. Last week, we agreed that preschool and P1 to P3 classes would not revert to remote learning when years 12 to 14 return, and they will stay in school until Easter. We have now taken another important step with the executive decision to safely accelerate the pace of face-to-face learning, such uh, that all remaining pupils in uh, P4 to P7 will return to school from next Monday, the 22nd of March. This means that these pupils will have the welcome opportunity to reconnect in person with their schools, their teachers and their peers before the Easter break. Furthermore, subject to a final review of the prevailing public health conditions at the, at the end of this month, the Executive has agreed that the remaining groups of pupils in years 8 to 11 will return to school following the Easter break. These decisions mean that after Easter, all pupils should be back in school for full-time face-to-face teaching, taking us to phase three for schools in the Northern Ireland Executive's Pathway Out of Restrictions document. This is a significant milestone in the uh, return to a normalised educational environment. I am confident that with the public support, we are now moving beyond the last widespread interruption to classroom learning and that with additional mitigations, schools will remain fully open until the summer term and in future academic years, bring all the benefits of school-based learning, social interaction and shared experience. I recognise that there may be bumps in the road and the need for some localised responses to outbreaks, but our measured approach has created the best conditions for a sustainable return to the classroom for all pupils. This is not an immediate return to business as usual or even a pre-pandemic school environment. While school meals will be offered to all children in attendance at school for both, fee, uh, for both free school meals and paying pupils, in the short term, some areas of provision will remain paused. For example, uh, school-managed breakfast clubs, education visits, inter-school sports and after-school activities will remain paused until advised otherwise. My department will liaise with the Department of Health to clarify the position before schools return after Easter. Furthermore, youth service provision and targeted early years programmes such as Sure Start have not yet been permitted to reopen. I would wish to pay tribute to both those, these sectors for the innovative ways that they have provided targeted support for vulnerable children and young people uh, throughout the pandemic, but I appreciate the limitations and frustrations of continuing to operate in this way. The Executive's Pathway Out of Restrictions document 
states that by the end of, of phase two, there would be a partial reopening of generic youth services and a resumption of Sure Start. I will continue to make the case for this to happen as soon as possible. I have committed to work uh, closely with Minister Swan throughout this, uh, or I've continued to work uh, closely with Minister Swan throughout this pandemic to ensure that my department provides the most up-to-date guidance and support to schools, taking account of all available public health advice. Schools are safe places, and there will be additional measures to help schools uh, stay safe. The latest version of my document's guidance, issued on the 5th of March, includes additional requirements for face-to-face uh, for face coverings in post-primary schools and on school transport. Schools have been supplied with additional signage to reinforce the key public messages for parents and visitors, and the EA will arrange a programme of compliance checks on school buses to ensure guidance is being followed. A further mitigation available as part of the school's return is the regular testing of people who do not have symptoms of COVID. The purpose is to find individuals who are unaware they are infected so they can be advised to isolate, thereby reducing the risk of them unwittingly spreading infection in school and elsewhere. This approach makes use of a type of self-test, the lateral flow device, otherwise known as LFD, which provides a result within 30 minutes. I made a joint announcement on Monday with Minister Swan, setting out uh, our plans, and I have written to schools to provide more detail. Regular asymptomatic testing of staff and pupils in special schools using an alternative method has also commenced this week following a successful pilot. The rollout of asymptomatic, asymptomatic, asymptomatic testing in schools has three phases. Phase one from the 22nd of March, all staff in post-primary schools and all pupils in years 12 to 14 will be invited to commence familiarisation to enable twice weekly self-testing using LFDs. This will cover the period up to the Easter break and allow staff and students who participate to self-test before attending school after Easter, providing uh, further reassurance to staff and students returning after the holiday. Identifying infectious individuals early could ultimately reduce the risk of large groups of exam year classes having to isolate during this important period. We have chosen to begin with this group as years 12 to 14 are those with the highest prevalence of infection and where testing will bring most benefit. A range of information and resources for schools, students and parents will be provided to show staff and pupils how to correctly conduct a self-test. Engagement has also, has also taken place this week with a representative group of school leaders and teachers and support staff uh, trade union representatives. In phases two and three commencing after the Easter break, the programme will expand to include all staff in primary schools and then nursery, preschool and at least initially uh, preschool uh, education providers participating in the preschool education programme. Precise details of this, of this later phasing are being established and will be clarified further prior to launch. No test is completely accurate, but studies indicate that LFDs have a very high degree of effectiveness at detecting those who are infectious. If a pupil or member of staff has a positive result from the LFD test, they and their household must isolate immediately. In-school contacts are not required to isolate at that stage. The individual must uh, then take a uh, polymerase uh, chain reaction or PCR test, which is available in local testing centres. If the PCR test is negative, then they uh, and their household can stop isolating and return to school. If it's positive, the COVID infection is confirmed. The person will continue to isolate and community contact tracing, including in the school, will be carried out as with any uh, confirmed PCR test. This confirmatory PCR test is an important part of the pathway and reduces the risk of people isolating unnecessarily because of false positive results and will ensure that we will not unnecessarily ask years 12 to 14 pupils to isolate during the key phase in their return to school and their preparation for assessments. I understand that post-primary schools, when they return next week for the years 12 to 14, will be busy welcoming back their pupils and preparing for the assessment process, but I encourage them to participate in the asymptomatic testing programme, as it is another tool to help keep our schools safe and minimise any disruption in the coming period. I recognise that the decision on Tuesday has provided less time for schools to prepare for the return to primaries P4 to P7 than I would prefer. 
I had previously said that I would like to give at least 10 days' notice for further changes. While that will apply for the return of post-primary pupils in years 8 to 11 after Easter, it has not been possible to do so for P4s to P7. I had originally intended that this decision would be taken last week, but the executive decision-making on the restrictions meant that the P4 to P7 decision was considered as part of the scheduled wider executive review of the COVID restrictions that took place on Tuesday, as set out in the Northern Ireland pathway out of restrictions process. While I accept that this is not ideal, I strongly believe that we should not uh, delay the return to school of these pupils a day longer than is absolutely necessary. I know that teachers and all school staff will do their utmost to ensure that pupils can return safely next week. I also look forward to going out to schools, as I regularly do, to see the great work that goes on there on a daily basis. Schools are at the centre of our communities, and their full reopening is an important step on the gradual pathway out of the current restrictions. Our schools and education other than at school or IOTA centres have proved a vital service to their pupils and wider communities in recent months through through the delivery of remote learning and supervised learning for vulnerable and key worker children. This meant we could uh, both look after those who need school most and enable key workers to continue with their jobs. I I must also pay tribute to our special schools, which have remained open throughout this period, providing vital education and care to those children who are amongst the most valuable in our society. It is for this reason that the Executive agreed a vaccination programme for special school staff who were supporting children who are extremely clinically vulnerable. Those staff are now receiving their vaccinations. Equally, the work done in uh, our IOTA centres uh, should be commended, along with the work which youth services continue to do, often remotely, over the, last, uh, over the past months. This has been a very challenging period for all. And given the significant disruption to our children's learning and mental health, our focus must now be on educational and well-being support, which will be critical to their future prospects. With the backing of the Executive, I intend to invest in the necessary resources to help pupils address any disruption to their learning that may have been faced since the start of the pandemic. I will be bringing a paper to the Executive shortly, seeking support for a wide range of summer schools and a further engaged programme. Uh, I thank the Minister, Minister for making a statement. And I will now allow members to, to ask questions. I will allow a period of around one hour for this. It is my intention to allow all members who wish to ask a question to do so. They will also have an opportunity for supplementary questions. However, this does, I would remind members, does depend on members asking focused and succinct questions. The chairperson of the Committee for Education will be allowed more latitude than other members in asking his questions. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I too commend our education sector for the courageous and dedicated leadership that it has shown throughout the pandemic and for the resilience shown by our, our families across Northern Ireland. We, we welcome uh, news of, of school return uh, with open arms. However, Mr. Speaker, in addition to when uh, school will return, it is also of great importance as to how. Uh, pupils in schools were initially told that there will be exams this year, and schools were advised do not therefore over assess. Of course, however, exams have since been cancelled, although recent guidance has told schools that assessment conducted in controlled conditions will have higher value as evidence in centre determined grades. As a result of that, I am receiving reports from distressed pupils advising that schools that took that initial guidance are now scheduling multiple controlled assessments, some of which has been referred to as an assessment blitz. This at a time when advice is that school returns should focus on emotional regulation, not testing. So can I ask the Minister how such a situation has been allowed to transpire and what he will do, what he will do to ensure that mental health as well as assessment is protected? Thank the Chair for his questions. It is the case that with the cancellation of exams, the the only other process is some form of assessment. A tool has been made available by way of assessment resources, but it has also been made very clear by CCA in terms of the guidance given to schools. That should be something that is not overly used, and indeed, myself in terms of uh, and the um, chief executive of CCA earlier on this week um, did a question and answer session, which will go out as well on social media in addition to the guidance. Um, because I think there will be some schools who, will, who may seek to um, 
over-assess in, re in relation to that. And so talk, I think, that in some schools of them trying to schedule in 40 um, assessments, for instance, is, is something that is way over the top and they shouldn't be going at, at that level on it. It is the case that there is no, um, and so therefore it is about something that is proportionate. Indeed, even the assessment tools that are, that are being put in place for schools are voluntary for the schools to uh, operate. They're not a, an issue of compulsion on that basis, but effectively one other opportunity where schools can do that. It is the case that simply moving from an exam situation to something which is robust in terms of assessment, which is evidence-based in terms of assessment, which will be accepted, for instance, by universities and future by employers, you know, there is no easy way of that simply being a, a very light touch regime in which there is no level of assessment take place. So there, it, there does need to be a balance struck. But I, I think there will be some that will overinterpret that. And I think we want to make it clear that there will be a limited level uh, there should be a limited level of assessment that schools are using to be able to produce that, that level of evidence. Supplementary, Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the minister for that response, and we'll explore that in more detail at the Education Committee. Can I can I ask the minister what, uh, if any, contingency planning is occurring for post-primary transfer next year in order to avoid the distress that has been caused by a, a chaotic process faced by pupils this year? Well, I'll be happy to work. It, it does lie a little bit outside the um, particular remit of the statement of the ad hoc today. However, look, it is the case, as indicated, that we're working with others to see whether there's any pathways that can be suggested that will be um, easier. I, I know, sort of, along with others, for instance, I would be supportive, if, it's, if at all possible, for those tests to take place within uh, post primary, within sorry, within primary schools. And I'll be happy to talk to stakeholders along with. And I know there's been. Uh, considerable effort around that. It is the case that in terms of legally the criteria that will be set by schools and whether they use academic selection or don't or the format is legally a matter for, for those. It is not something which the department is in a position to impose. And it is also the case, as we uh, it was mentioned a little bit in the debate that we had uh, on Tuesday as regards uh, the broader issue of post-primary provision in South Belfast, which Naturally enough, I think probably every speaker eventually touched upon the issue of post-primary transfer, um, that without any form of academic selection, there is a concern that schools will then fall back on other criteria, which people will also see as being unfair, be it in terms of even the use of, of siblings. And we want to reach a situation where, in terms of those schools, that, that, that at least everybody has some level of, of chance uh, within that. It is also the case that across the board, not just for uh, that year's, I want to see the executive backup programme of an engaged programme which will lead then to uh, a level of academic recovery. That's something that goes well beyond where P6 and P7 are, but across all the years as well. Nicole Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the Minister for making his statement today. And I join with the Minister in paying tribute to all those who are involved in the education of, of our children uh, through this, this pandemic. I, I noted the, the very positive media reports last night, uh, uh, Minister, uh, following the announcement of the return of the year four to seven, uh, and indeed both the joy on the faces of, of the pupils. Um, I don't understand it. I wasn't that keen to go to school. But the joy of, the, of those young people who wanted to get back to school for all the right reasons, and indeed the uh, support that was offered uh, from the parents uh, as, as they made the return uh, to, to school. I would like to pay tribute to a, a principal in my own constituency who has been unique in the way that she has welcomed the P1 to 3 uh, pupils uh, by providing them with a nice, nice cream. Uh, when, when they arrived, and the intention of her now to provide the whole school with ice cream when they return on, on, on Monday. Can I, can I ask you, Minister, the, the Engage programme has been a very successful programme, um, and indeed uh, I, I would hope will be rolled out uh, in, into the next academic year. Could I ask the Minister if he will A, be making uh, an application uh, for support from his executive colleagues. Uh, does he anticipate that he would indeed uh, have the support of the finance minister uh, as, as, we, as the, the new academic year comes around and Engage can be rolled out for those pupils? 
Thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, look, I, I welcome any of the initiatives. I think I know. I know certainly have another school where. I think on Monday, in terms of their wider bit, we'll also be getting an ice cream van. So it means that uh, across the system, uh, in every sense of the word, we can be hundreds and thousands will be welcomed uh, in a number of schools. <laughs> it's, it's always very useful to get groans from your own side in, in connection with that. But in, in all seriousness, um, look, I think there is a, a level of joy that is there for young people returning to school. Um, maybe, as I was mentioning, an anecdote I've mentioned before that I know that. Last year, uh, I, one of my officials had overheard a conversation uh, involving a, uh, a parent with two young children, one of which was behaving very angelically and the other was uh, less so. And eventually, the, the parent um, lost patience with the, the more, disruptive pupil and said, or more disruptive child and said, if you don't behave yourself, I'll not allow you back to school. So there has been an important change of element which, joking aside, leads to a very serious point. In terms of the Engage programme, yes, I'll be looking, first of all, for the Engage programme that the initial funding, as because it's related to the financial year, rolled on until the end of March. So I'll be looking, first of all, for funding that will take place uh, for the rest of the school year. Uh, I will then also be looking, as part of that, uh, for investment in terms of mental health, but also an Engage programme that can run from September onwards. At present, um, the position is, and it may be also a moving, moving feast, that the final draft of the budget for next year has not as yet uh, been finally agreed by the executive. And similarly, as part of that, there is a, uh, I think, a slightly movable feast in terms of the level of COVID funding that would be there. And so I'll be seeking uh, that support because I think it's vital that, uh, I, you know, I don't think we're ever going to completely close the gap in what has happened, but at least if we can narrow the gap between the level of disruption that has taken place. Um, and reaching what would have been normality, I think that that, that would be good work that can be done across the system. Supplementary, Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Ma uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the minister. Uh, minister, are we at a stage as yet that we actually know what the gap in the learning is for pupils at both primary and second level education? Well, I think there's been some levels of academic studies that have taken place within that, and I think. I think at this stage, I suppose, the, the level of information is slightly tentative. Look, I think what I would particularly pay tribute to, I think there's been a lot of hard work done, particularly during this lockdown. I think because the first lockdown took everybody by surprise, there was a slightly rough and ready quality to it. But I think there has been a lot of good work that's been done by way of remote learning. I think it is difficult to quantify that, but we know that there is a damage that's been done in terms of education because it is not, it cannot be simply the same as you would have in terms of um, uh, that face-to-face -face teaching. And I think it is also firmly established that that will be most acutely felt where there's levels of deprivation uh, and the levels of support within certain families are not as strong, perhaps sometimes, as, as they could be elsewhere. Quantifying that will be difficult. And I think, as with also with mental health, it will not be something where there can be almost a two-dimensional point taken just at one particular day. It is something which I think there will be a level of reverberation for some time to come. Before I call our next speaker, could I just remind members that, as I said at the outset, I am determined to try to let every member who wants to ask a question the opportunity to do that, but we are already only into two members of asking questions and there is no chance of me delivering that. So I do not want to be raining on, on anybody's parade, but if we can c cut the anecdotes and the good nature all that out and go straight to questions. And I call Pat Sheehan. Thank you, Minister, for his statement uh, today. And I wonder, would he join with me in congratulating St Mary's Grammar School in my own constituency in West Belfast for the decisive action that they took during the week uh, when they abandoned the use of transfer tests uh, for this autumn on the basis of the unprecedented mental and emotional stresses that children and young people are facing as a result of the pandemic? Well, Thanks. Thank the member and in the interest of the speakers, but I'll not give any anecdotes at this stage. On it. Look, the member, indeed, there is a wide range of views in terms of academic selection throughout this chamber. I would take a different view with that, but ultimately it's up to each school to make the choices in terms of its own criteria within that. So while I would not necessarily be on the same page as St Mary's, I respect their decision. I'll take that as a no, Minister. 
Um, but I mean, the, the adverse impact of the pandemic on the mental health of our young children has been flagged up repeatedly now. Uh, and indeed, you yourself has a, have advanced the issue of mental health as a reason for getting children back to school. And leaving aside for a moment your ideological commitment to academic selection, do you really think it's fair to expect 10 year olds to participate in high pressure, high stakes exams uh, in, the, in the context of all the disruption they've experienced over the last uh, year? And will you now act decisively and avoid making the mistakes of this year's transfer tests by telling schools? to abandon transfer tests for this coming year? Thanks. Well, and the short answer of that is no, because schools have a legal right to have academic selection. I also believe academic selection does act for many children as being the enablers um, in relation to that. Uh, the member talks about stress that is there, and I appreciate, I think, in almost any direction that, that, that we go on some of these issues, there will be a level of stress. But stress is also there for families and indeed for children who are then told, actually because of an accident at birth, you have no opportunity whatsoever to attend a particular school. And so we've got to look at that as well. I, I, I suspect if we had a longer period of time, there would, it would not be one that myself and the member, or indeed many members in this, this chamber, would necessarily reach a common position on. I call Justin McNulty. Minister, I have to pay a tribute to our teachers, principals, staff. Um, school leaders, especially in, in our special schools who have been back at the coast to face so much longer, for EOTAS teams, for our Sure Start teams, for how they have adapted throughout this pandemic and to, who've maintained their composure and led our children has been extraordinary. And the, 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 the depth of the challenges we faced in an extraordinary assured manner. In terms of the gap, the widening educational gap that's going to be very evident now as, as an outcome of this pandemic where some kids are going to fall further behind. What additional resource are you attributing to, to help those kids catch up? We know we talked about the recharge programme, catch up physically, emotionally, and mentally, um, and socially. How are those kids who have been left further behind, how, how are they going to be focused on help to catch up? Peripatetic support and other help. Thank the member. Look, I will be putting in a paper and have indicated that um, there are a number of elements to that. Um, it will be dependent ultimately then upon the executive signing off on that as a, uh, an overall package. It will involve the rollout of the Engage programme for the rest of this summer, which, or sorry, the rest of this academic term, sorry, the next academic term, the rest of this academic year. Uh, it will involve a programme of activities, some academic and some non-academic within the, the summer, you know, uh, and thirdly, it will involve both uh, a widened engaged programme for the next academic year and also direct COVID money in terms of mental health, because I think it's part of there's a level of interaction between those. All those will be dependent upon receiving the support uh, of the executive and receiving finance. And ultimately, in terms of resources, I can put in whatever resources are made directly available. That would basically be through COVID funding. I would say in terms of there has also been a recognition in the broader level, particularly as regards mental health, um, beyond simply the COVID situation, which was why uh, a number of weeks ago, um, myself and the health minister were able to jointly launch the emotional health and wellbeing framework with committed resources, which will be baselined. As with all things, if there was more money that was available, I think the, that all of us could do more, but I think it's important that we actually get the maximum amount of investment um, that is into our schools, particularly as regards that catch up during that period. Supplementary, Justin McNulty. Thank you, Minister. Minister, I'm really worried about the physical impact of this pandemic on kids, and in that, I don't see any reference to sports. What are the kids going to do? Are they all going to be piled back into the classroom now from, from Monday onwards or from after, after Easter onwards, where they need to have a bit of fun in their lives, need a bit of physical activity? What's the guidance in terms of returns, return to the sports pitch? Get them out in the open, let them have fun. What's the guidance? Well, in relation to that, again, it's part of the wider executive decision. So, as, as part of the resumption of the first step, um, physical education will be available. PE has, has been whenever schools have been uh, in place. Similarly, the, the position as regards sports is largely speaking aligned with other elements of sport. So, the next step, I think, will be, um, as with sporting clubs, that there will be permission then given in terms of the training side of it rather than. Uh, direct competition between amateur sports, and in many ways there will be a direct tie-in, I think, between there certainly shouldn't be any 
later movement on school sports than there is in sports in general. Look, I, I perfectly accept um, what the member has said in terms of the, um, the benefits greatly of, of sports. And I know there's maybe been a bit of a false assumption because uh, the reference to opening up sports generally within the Pathways document has been at phase two of the sports side of it. It's mentioned directly in phase four on the education side. What I would highlight is that directly after Easter we'll be in a position where we've already reached phase three of that. And I think it's important that we move ahead as, as quickly as possible because, uh, and I think the member would, would entirely agree that providing that, that holistic solutions for young people it's not just purely about their academic side of things or even their mental health side of things important while they are. It is also about the physical side of things as well. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for attending today. I know there are many parents out there who are very grateful uh, that children are returning to school and probably have, have probably learned to appreciate teachers much more than they ever did, and that's, uh, we, we're all seeing that. Minister, um, there's a line in the statement today, and it talks about, um, particularly about years 13 and 14, I think it, it, it points to years 11 and 12, and it says about preparing for the assessment process. And as the Chair has pointed out, um, the students were told that examinations were cancelled, and unfortunately, it looks like in some cases, that examinations aren't cancelled, and a lot of students are, are, are very worried. The CCA sent out updated guidance this week, which has helped alleviate some of that stress. Can you um, please clarify something for me? The word optionality has been used twice in the context of this previous few months. The first optionality was options of different papers to take, but then optionality more laterally has meant actually optional whether you take an exam or an assessment or not. Can you inform students today how much they say they will have in deciding whether an assessment is the best uh, uh, way for them to be awarded their examination results this year? Schools are broadly speaking deciding themselves. There is the option that if a school, for instance, is not providing an assessment tool, that the individual student can opt into that on that basis. But look, you know, uh, it is important that the balance has got right. But if we're to be in a situation in which no exams take place as well, there will have to be levels of assessment. There's no easy way getting around that. There's no easy way of uh, unscrambling that, that egg in that, in that regard. Uh, but I think it is important that schools do not go over the top. And I think that was one of the worries that was there, uh, indeed highlighted in terms of other jurisdictions when they've moved away from examinations, which is why there's no easy pathway outside of examinations. But look, both in terms of the advice that has gone out this week from CCEA, and also, I suppose, to try to um, do direct question and answer sessions. I've, I've done a session of which can be provided both to schools and the wider public uh, with Justin Edwards this week, which will be going out as well on social media to provide that and indeed supply it to schools as well. So it is about trying to provide that, that level of balance. Uh, we've also got to realise that, that, it, that the results have also got to be one which are regarded as being robust as well. Supplementary, Robbie Butler. Thank you for your answer, Minister, and I do uh, welcome the fact that you are certainly giving some comfort uh, for schools to perhaps not lean too heavily on assessment. Um, to, to look at the, the, the physical dangers of COVID when, when young people return to school, one of the um, key fightbacks, if you like, is ventilation. So some of our school estate is old. Um, what has been assessed and what has been uh, given to schools to ensure that they can ventilate their, their schools in such a way, uh, whether that is ensuring that there's finance for heating to keep the heating going and the windows are open, the, the ambience is kept well, which is conducive for learning and, uh, and emotionally regulating, and also can you give schools comfort that actually maybe a relaxation in terms of school uniforms, for instance, might be appropriate um, as, as children return to school? Look, from that point of view, I, I, like I want to see whatever flexibility can be put in place. There will, particularly on the issue of ventilation, be a matter for each individual school. Where there's any level of support that needs to be given, we will try and do that. Um, but one of the things I think is, it becomes very apparent, um, outside I think of schools that have been built very recently in the last few years, is the massive diversity within the, the school estate. Um, you know, it is the case that quite often in Northern Ireland, uh, a lot of um, housing estates or indeed housing developments, you could blindfold, you wouldn't have a clue what town you were in. It seems to me that in terms of schools, certainly those that were built beyond sort of 10 years ago from, from now, are all uniquely different in, the, in terms of the way that they, they uh, are there. Uh, in terms of the other issue, as well as ventilation, uh, school uniform, yeah. School uniform itself is something which is directly decided by uh, the Board of Governors in a school themselves. I think it is appropriate that uh, I would certainly encourage them, while I don't have, therefore have a power over that, that I would say that this needs to be looked at particularly in a fairly flexible manner, even if this is on the basis of taking a particular short-term position. I know there's a wider discussion, which I know is exercised 
myself and predecessors within the post along the lines of what can be done in terms of direct requirements of school uniforms and where some schools um, over egg and over cost things on that, on that basis. But I think in particular as we look ahead towards the near future, I think there is merit in, in showing a level of flexibility for schools in recognising the unique circumstances that, that they are in. And this can all contribute to try to make sure we have a smooth flow uh, in terms of school remaining in place. Call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, can I thank the Minister uh, for his engagement on this very issue. Uh, many parents that I have spoke to, in fact, every parent is absolutely overjoyed to see their child returning back to the classroom, both to see their friends and indeed their teachers, uh, I think as much for their, for their own well-being as as much as their children. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of those parents for leaving. That has been a lonely furrow at times for you, but your dedication and commitment to seeing those children back to face-to-face -to -face teaching is commendable. Um, do you agree with me that the return to school is essential for that social and that mental well-being of those children, particularly as they have had such a prolonged period outside the classroom? Yeah, I, I suppose to keep this as saying, yes, uh, I would. And obviously, a lot of the focus at times is on the academic side of it. But we've got to realise that, for example, even for P4s to P7s, when they return next week, they will have been, given that they were there until the um, Christmas break, for those pupils, they will have been out of school and out of direct contact with a lot of their peers uh, for a total of 13 weeks. Even for the years 8 to 11, which I think in different jurisdictions have tended to be phased as the last uh, piece in the, the jigsaw, will have been out of school for 16 weeks. And to some extent, it may be easier sometimes to put programmes in place which can lead to a level of academic catch-up. Um, the particular impact from a, a mental health point of view will be severe on a lot of young people. Uh, you know, I've said in terms of the restriction on their lifestyles, probably the two groups in society that have suffered the most through COVID in terms of impact on their, on their lives have been the very elderly, some of whom have been left very isolated, who have maybe a particular level of vulnerability to the virus, but also the very young as well. Uh, and I think um, some of the sort of the freedoms that, that many of us would have enjoyed as, as young people, the opportunity to interact with our peers, have been by necessity denied them for a period of time. And I hope gradually we can move away from that situation. Supplementary, Jonathan Buckley. Thank you. And I thank the Minister for his response. And following on from Mr McNulty's point in relation to with a prolonged period of outside the classroom, we all know that returning to it will be difficult, both for students, uh, pupils who are at different levels in terms of their educational uh, attainment throughout this period, but also for, te uh, for, per for teachers as well. Can the Minister outline us if he has had any discussions with school leaders as to how they can use that period of time to, to break those children in gently to what has been a very difficult period? Yeah, I mean, look, there's ongoing discussions with a range of stakeholders, including the, the unions, and as part of that, um, it is the case that I think the advice and guidance that we're giving, in the same way as I think was, was measured, particularly in the P1s to P3s, is that the, the initial period is a certain level of familiarisation uh, that pupils will have uh, with the, the situation, also to try and draw out were there any problems. I thought it was very good when I was at, um, at, on Monday. Monday a week ago at, um, at Springfield Primary, uh, they for their P3s were doing a, an exercise called sort of the Worryosaurus, where people were able to put down where the concerns were in P3 and also the things that they saw of particular level of comfort for them. And I think you know, there will be that period of adjustment that will be there, particularly for our young people, also for our teachers and our parents. And I think it's about ensuring, obviously, the sooner we're able to get back, the sooner we're able to do that and then move on into the sort of further resumption of the academic uh, career. I remember Nicola Brogan. I call Nicola Brogan. Sorry, I thank Charlie and I thank the Minister for his statement here um, this afternoon. Can I ask the Minister to outline how the public health situation will be assessed um, so that more year groups can return to school in line with the new timetable? We're working closely with PHA and indeed it's important to recognise that as part of this and part of this will be monitoring a level of compliance that will be largely working with schools. We don't want to create something that's overly burdensome for them. Um, in terms of public health uh, on movement, I think the provisional position is that everyone will be back after Easter. There will obviously be a level of review that needed at the end of the month to make sure that, that all is going well. I would expect, unless there is something dramatically changes with the, the, um, the figures between then and now, 
that everything will be fine on that basis. And we can also draw on uh, the experience that's happening in other jurisdictions, because it's not just Northern Ireland that's going back. Most of the other jurisdictions are either in the process of or making sort of a full, uh, a full return uh, within that. So it is about sort of monitoring all those things and working closely. And I should note as well uh, that the, the paper which led to the timings of these introductions was one uh, that followed sort of discussions with health, that ones that health were uh, perfectly happy to endorse as a, as a way forward. And therefore, I think we were able to reach a consensus position within the executive uh, on the papers regards school return. So it's not, if you like, uh, anybody going on any level of solo run or pushing a particular agenda. It's something that the executive as a whole, and I think across the executive, uh, there has been that desire to show that there is support for our young people, that they ought to be prioritised ahead of, of anything else. And I think it's very, it's, it is very good to see that this has not just been rhetoric, but then it's been translated into actual activity. Okay, Stella, Nicola Rogan, supplementary. I thank you, Rilla, and um, I agree, Minister. We've said from the beginning the best place for our children is back in school, so um, we're all pleased about that. Um, the Minister, you will be aware that school principals faced a huge burden towards the end of um, term last year when effectively they were asked to become um, track and tracers within their own schools. What work has been undertaken by yourself and colleagues within um, the health department to enhance the level of support that the PHA, PHA will be offering to school principals? Well, I think, I think drawing us those two issues in relation to that, um, on the track and trace, I think there is expanded capacity within PHA in terms of tracking and tracing. I think part of the problem is, and this is something which is very difficult to overcome, and I appreciate it does create a level of burden that is there for schools. If, for instance, there is an identification of an individual or a group of, of children who are then testing positive, the knowledge of who those children have had a level of interaction with, it, it's not something which can ultimately then clearly be worked out. There's guidance can be given, but in terms of identifying individuals, it's very difficult to do that other than on a school basis on it. Uh, we feel that, that while this may lead, uh, in some cases, to false positives and uh, a short initial period of some children being off, the uh, going alongside of course WATS test and tracing, the, the lateral flow test hopefully will create a situation in which on a precautionary basis uh, we get a much clearer position of those who need to be in and those who aren't in and we think that those processes as they roll out uh, should be of, of benefit. We should also realise that in terms of the evidence in terms of transmission of the virus, while clearly it can happen between adults and children and vice versa, the biggest issues that have tended to be found have been where there's transmission on the one hand between children or between adults, uh, which is why particularly the level of concentration is also there uh, on staff members uh, as we move ahead. Paul Frey. Mr Speaker, will the Minister agree with me that Sure Start and youth services are critical support for many people? And will he agree to continue to press the Health Minister and his executive colleagues to allow these critical services to reopen? as quickly as possible? Well, look, it's certainly my intention. I've put in initially papers to the task force, which have not as yet been considered directly by the executive, on generic youth restart and also on sure start. Uh, and I will work with both the executive task force and the Minister of Health in trying to realise uh, those in terms of actions. Uh, I think both are very important. Obviously, I'm particularly acutely aware for sure start that because of the nature of sure start is particularly targeted in at areas where there is a uh, greater challenge in terms of socio-economic side of things, that there is a particular importance for those families, and particularly these are dealing with very young, young children. So I would hope to see progress on both. I think it is likely that Sure Start is probably the one that there will be um, the quickest potential route, but I think the sooner we can get back to all these facilities, because it's Obviously, for the benefit not simply of the children, but also the families directly involved themselves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the dearth of information flow from the health department uh, down to the public of late with regards to lifting restrictions, what evidence has the health minister or the CMO, for that matter, provided to your department minister on Sure Start and your services and the chance of opening them up? and the reasons and the rationale for keeping them down? Well, at present, the papers were put into the task force. At present, they have not reached the position of being put into the executive. So from that perspective, I don't think there's been something which is 
overly definitive other than, I suppose, perhaps uh, some within health who are concerned in terms of taking the number of steps, what can be opened up at any one particular stage. But in terms of the detail of the data on those specific areas, from a health perspective, it may well be that the health minister may be in a better position to be able to provide some of that information to the member than myself. I call Donald Dowd. Uh, and as a parent of a son in rang a P4, I'm delighted. The children are going back, though I have to say, I'm not half as delighted as his mother, who has been his teacher for the last three months. Uh, I'm not sure his views are the same, but however. Uh, I have to say, Minister, uh, just in re- following on from Mr. Frew's questions around youth services, I can understand why youth services buildings have been closed, but your department issued a direction on the 6th of March, which I think has had unintended consequences for early years providers such as preschools and playgroups, because if youth centre buildings are closed, they can't access them. And many groups did use youth centres for their preschool and playgroups activities. So would the Minister undertake to review the direction issued on the 6th of March and amend it to allow uh, preschool and early years groups to use those buildings? Certainly I'll, I'll commit to uh, doing that. I don't think we should have in anything unintended consequences. I think uh, it is also the case that the sooner that we can get our youth centres open, because I think they, they play a vital role. I know at times, and I can understand this, that, that particularly those involved in youth work feel that they are almost neglected compared to the, uh, the greater level of publicity at times that will be surround schools. Uh, and I think they play a critical role. In part, I suppose, one of the issues, particularly as regards youth services, that we need to realise um, is that while this will lead to some levels of greater contact, and interaction between young people, it's doing so in a controlled environment. And I think a lot of the problems that we have had with the spread of the virus has been in different groups where there isn't a level of control that has been, been put in place. Uh, but clearly in terms of, obviously we'll work alongside health in terms of what, what can be done, but I'll be happy to uh, review that to make sure that there isn't an unintended uh, blockage um, for anyone making use of facilities. Supplementary, John uh, I welcome the Minister's commitment to re- review that direction uh, and await the outcome of the task force report on new services. Would the Minister agree with me that if we want to keep our children in school, and it's the best place for our children or our young adults, that we as adults are going to have to ensure our behaviour does not allow for the continued spread of the virus or the enhanced spread of the virus? Because unfortunately, if the virus reaches the peaks that it did pre Christmas, we will be faced with the decision again of closing our schools, and I think that will be an entire shame. Well, look, I agree with the, the member. I think one of the tragedies of this is that it has quite often been adult behaviour, which actually then young people. I mean, a lot of us that are, that are adults, to some extent, in terms of our day-to-day lives, have a level of restrictions, have been able to work around those, have a level of resilience, and effectively get on with our lives in a different way. I think one of the tragedies of the events of the last year has been in many ways that our young people have paid the penalty quite often for actions, quite often levels of disregard of, um, uh, of either good advice or regulations that adults have taken, and they've paid the, the price for that. I think there's a rule for all of us, uh, whether it is simply as adults or as parents. That's why, for example, I know one of the concerns, there's been lot, lots of great work being done by parents, but one of the issues that we're trying to, and I think there is still, there's still work to be done on this, um, is as part of this, it is, for instance, we're using signage around schools on a very proactive nature to say to, you know, observe social distancing, wear a mask whenever you're doing the pick-up. And there's still too many cases of, of people standing around the school gates talking to each other and creating that level of risk. There is still, as I, in my day-to-day life, go into supermarkets, garages, still seeing too many people not wearing face coverings uh, and others at various levels disregarding the, either that uh, health guidance or indeed regulations. And I think for all of us, uh, being responsible has a critical role in, in how quickly, not just within the education sector, but across the piece as a whole, we can actually start getting back to normal life. If people behave responsibly, uh, we can stop the spread of this virus very effectively. It is up to all of us to play our contribution to that. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for coming here today. Can I just ask, in the statement, Minister, it says um, that there may be bumps in the road and the need for some localised responses to outbreaks. Um, I suppose implicit in that is the need for uh, 
it sort of goes on f further on from what Mr. O'Dowd was alluding to in his previous question, but specific closures of specific schools or closures of sex of schools, what specific um, contingency plans are in place in his department to ensure those are managed properly and ideally can be minimised in terms of impact? Well, look, from that point of view, first of all, all schools have had a direction from September onwards that they need to have essentially ready at any stage the opportunity for remote learning. Uh, what I think is the case is it, if we look at where incidents have happened, uh, in some occasions maybe there's been action on a very precautionary nature to close a school for a particular short period of time. In most cases, it has not been, as was what is particularly being alluded to, a need entirely to close a school. It may well be that from a contact tracing point of view, there are a number of children within a class or even a class bubble, which has to be at home for a period of time, and therefore those levels of contingencies need to be uh, in place. Where I think the bigger impact sometimes in schools has been, which creates a level of short-term disruption, is if there is, for instance, an outbreak in terms of COVID amongst the adult staff, that can maybe create a very short-term scenario of the number of staff that are suddenly being deprived, it takes even a few days to find substitutes, uh, you know, so that can have a, a degree of impact. So whenever I'm, I'm saying this, I think everyone will accept, um, as we had during the autumn, we had very high levels of attendance, as happened in other jurisdictions, um, during the autumn period, but there will be individual cases where either a class has to go out or a group of individuals. I think with the lateral flow test, hopefully this will therefore keep this to a minimum and try and target it in of those who have got that, that that positive uh, side of things, but you know, I don't think anyone is pretending that for every single student things are going to be perfectly smooth and there won't be some level of interruption for some. Supplementary, Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in relation to the academic impact on students, particularly those students from poorer backgrounds, um, can I ask the Minister what work is going on in his department, drawing on what other jurisdictions, frankly, around the world, I, I assume, are doing in terms of measuring that impact? Because we, do, we all know that this will have had a terrible impact on all students, but a particularly terrible impact on kids from poorer backgrounds. I think in order to address that within the short and long term, we need a real serious quantitative base in terms of information. What is his department doing to study that and take action on it? Well, obviously, on, on two grounds. Um, first of all, I think specific to Northern Ireland, I think ETI are working then to be able to try to do levels of baselines as regards that and produce it more in a thematic approach. Because the, the idea is not to say to any particular school, your results are very poor, you know, shame on you. It's actually about trying to draw it on a more thematic basis. Uh, what can be done. There's also the case that I think a lot of the experience that we will see will be drawn from, both from Northern Ireland and other jurisdictions about trying to pull that level of information together. And that's why also from the point of view of the focus that was there in terms of the Engage programme that there is, has been throughout that. And while there may be some slight adjustments to the template, the template was one in which there was some level of help given to every school, but that it was particularly in terms of the resource availability was particularly strongly focused on whether there was above average levels of free school meal entitlement, which I appreciate is not perfect, but acts as some level of proxy, which gave a, a greater level of resource that was there. But also delegating down where those interventions needed to take place, particularly to schools themselves, so that, um, that on the ground, uh, a principal and their teachers could actually see who that, that certain resources needed to be most directed at, given that level of flexibility, rather than to try to create some sort of imposed system directly from on top. I call Christopher Stafford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his announcement that he has made? I, I declare an interest as a governor of Braniel Primary School. So at least one of my children has already benefited from the ice cream largesse that Robin Newton referred to. Speaking as a parent with a child in P6, a child in P5, a child in P3, and one who's due to start nursery school this year. I am really delighted by the announcement that the Minister has made. Can I ask the Minister, in terms of the recovery plans that he is talking about, that in terms of helping kids with uh, catching up academically, that those plans are not set in stone and that throughout this period the Department is prepared to take advice and suggestions from leaders in the field, particularly school principals with a particular insight? No, look, I think that's undoubtedly the case, which was why, for instance, in terms of Engage, it is about making levels of resources available, but the actual decisions on how they can be spent, it's very much delegated down directly to the schools themselves. 
I would like to see if we do get an overall package of money which involves both academic and broader well-being. Um, I think one of the lessons that we've learned is to try to make sure that there's flexibility between those different strands. So it may be within a particular school setting that there's a desire you know, to do those in a slightly different way in that regard. Um, and sometimes it can be doing very similar things, but in a way that is bespoke to that individual school. You know, it's not always a case of, you know, it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it is uh, important, and that can get results for that individual school. So it's about giving that level of flexibility. And also particularly on issues around mental health, that there's an adaptability that, that something we may see as being, here's the ideal model on day one, will have to be adaptable in terms of change uh, within that. Uh, so that, and the same, I suppose, with the emotional health and wellbeing framework, uh, that some of these things will be a, a certain level of testing out, and if we need to then adjust. And I think with the mental health and wellbeing, uh, in terms of the COVID response, again, that's been on the basis of giving schools a level of support, but a high level of flexibility, not just as most for the support that it gives children, but also we're acutely aware, because again, they, they tend to be the forgotten aspect of this in terms of mental health. What mental health support is there for teachers as well? And there's a level of flexibility can be given to schools to be able to provide that. Supplementary, Christopher Stalford. Thank you. Still related to the theme of academic recovery, uh, I know that in the past the uh, department uh, the EA rather uh, funded schemes to allow for extended school opening over summer holiday periods. Does the department have any intention of expanding such programs in order that the next that the summer period can be used? And I'm thinking particularly uh, for pupils in P6, for whom this coming November is going to be extremely important. I think as regards that again, as part of the package of measures across schools that we're looking at last summer which to some extent was a certain level of trialling. And I think perhaps last summer there was maybe a little bit of false expectation out there that, that we'd seen the worst of it and everything was behind us and therefore there maybe wasn't the same level of need. Uh, there was a range of summer activities that were particularly academically focused um, during the summer last year. And again, with all these things, we seek the support of schools to volunteer. And we had roughly speaking outside of special schools with, who had a particular bespoke programme uh, around about 50 mainstream schools that, that, that we have sought and looked to expand some of this this summer uh, across the period of primary and post-primary. And in terms of initial expressions of interest have been much greater this year than last year, which I think people realise the, the extent of that. And again, if the funding is available, the aim would be that that would, could be something that have a bit of flexibility. Some schools may want to do something for a week or two weeks or three weeks. And again, there should be that level of, of um, flexibility. And again, we want to be in a situation where there is that recovery for our young people that they can take on a voluntary basis the best advantage of that. We don't want to inflict another cruel summer on our young people. Uh, we want to actually have a situation in which there is those opportunities during the summer, but also looking ahead to the next academic year. And I thank the Minister for his statement. Um, while the emotional health and wellbeing framework the Minister references is obviously welcome, this was in development prior to the pandemic, and this has been a reoccurring theme of this afternoon's discussion. But given the wealth of additional challenges and pressures our children and schools now face, can the Minister elaborate on the COVID specific interventions he intends to make as our children return to the classroom? Well, look, I think the Member is entirely right in terms of and that's why this is on two particular levels. So the emotional health and well-being, which is something the executive approved and there's funding now being provided, is part of the overall education mainstream budget. It's something that is baselined. At the moment, that's on the basis with a contribution from health of an overall package of around about six and a half million for that framework. Again, that stands above what additional, what current spend is there in things like CAMS and, and the existing period. And it is important that we have something which is both mainstream and baseline, which means that we can say with confidence it will be there in 21, 22 and beyond. Um, but it is also the case that uh, there are specific challenges that are there of COVID. So as part of the overall bid for next year, um, there will be a specific bid as part of the broader sort of academic side of it to have specific funding being sought from the executive uh, for a sort of COVID mental health and wellbeing response, which again can be made available 
and will be made available through schools and to some extent also through youth services um, as well. Uh, and again, that level of flexibility on the ground of, of what can be, because you know, I suppose to use an example, a seven-year-old in rural Fermanagh may be in a different position from a 15-year-old in um, part of Belfast, for instance, on that basis. So it will not be necessarily a one-size-fits-all. And we believe that those on the ground, uh, from the point of view of schools and youth services, are in the best position to actually know a tailored position of what they, what they want to have that level of intervention on. Gemma Dolan, supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Um, you'll also be aware of concerns from the Audit Office that education recovery programmes established in England to help recover lost learning have not been reaching the most disadvantaged children where they are most needed. What steps are you taking to ensure that we don't face the same problems here and to ensure that those children who most require assistance are able to access it? Well, that's why I think the structure of funding, I think there's been an acceptance that there's a level of damage being done across the board, which is why, from the point of view of funding, even in some cases it's relatively low, that all schools are going to be and have this year in terms of the Engage programme will have received directly funding. However, it's on effectively two levels. Those where there is where there are schools which have a lower than average uh, level of free school meals have received one tranche of, of funding, um, which enables, I think, in terms of effectively a buy-in of, of additional hours in terms of staffing. I think off the top of my head it was maybe pitched at particular levels of days depending upon the size of the school. But there's a higher uh, level of funding which is then available at a much greater level to schools where they are above average free school meals. Now, um, I can appreciate as well, um, and ideally if there's a little bit of smoothing of the curve of this, we, we need to have something which could be implemented quickly and non-bureaucratic. So it, you know, it couldn't be something where we got a thousand different levels of funding uh, across the board, um, but there will always be a little bit of complication where schools that, that, that fall, if you like, just one side of a line or another side of a line and aware of that. But we hope in general that will enable that level of, of support. I think one problem that was faced this year was that there was a level of funding that was made available to schools on both Engage and mental health. And there was a cruel irony that in some cases COVID was both creating the problem but also actually acting sometimes as a bit of a barrier to a solution. Because, for example, maybe that the school wanted uh, during this term to have a, an additional teacher in teaching a small bespoke group face to face of, of pupils in the one classroom, and obviously then with remote learning, that has maybe not been in the position to be able to done to the same extent in that regard. But certainly moving ahead, I'll be bidding for money on those elements, and there's an intertwining of the two, I think. Can we now bring Andrew Muir on screen, please? Can I invite Andrew Muir to ask your question? Minister for his statement. Um, as the Minister be aware, there was concern previously in relation to the transmission of COVID-19 virus in relation to travel to and from school. Uh, what actions has he taken to mitigate that risk, particularly in relation to public transport? Well, in terms of, and um, it's good to see the member on, on screen, although not with his, without, he appears to be without his trademark bow tie uh, today, uh, which shows maybe a, a certain a casual level of, of, uh, of work from home. Yes, and look, it is difficult uh, these are things that are difficult sometimes to enforce. However, there was a shift, first of all, and aligned with public transport, and um, uh, also as part of that, um, the school transport then to make sort of a post-primary provision effectively then compulsory in terms of face coverings. There has been obviously a concern over the level of mixing because even if there's a little bit of flexibility sometimes in buses, getting the sheer volume of children on buses does make it difficult to do that. But as part of the measures which were initially, I think, ready to, to run uh, from January onwards, but then have become slightly moot for the last couple of months because of the, um, of the remote learning side of things. Uh, one of the interactions, EA working with TransLink and with PHA, are looking to do, um, provide a number of COVID marshals who will do spot checks, who will try to encourage, both in terms of um, uh, be it bus stations and also on buses, encourage those uh, children that are on the buses of appropriate age to be wearing face coverings. It is about trying to push that level of good behaviour. Uh, it is more difficult, um, I suppose, as with all issues, when you move outside the direct confines of the school itself, which I think 
tend to be a very safe environment, a very controlled environment. When you move into scenarios beyond the school gates, it does become more difficult in that regard. But working alongside our health colleagues, we're trying to take whatever interventions uh, we can to be able to move that forward. Supplementary, Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. One of the best ways for children and young people to travel to and from school is by active travel. What more is the Minister planning to do to encourage people to use that form of transport? Well, look, certainly we will work with uh, and have discussions at times with, with uh, the infrastructure minister to try to encourage particularly either cycling or walking to school. I, I think that will have particular pertinence um, in terms of, uh, because it, it's not just, if you like, the, the direct transport on buses. It also means that if a child is going in directly into school themselves, it removes some of the um, school gate issues that we would have in terms of drop-off, particularly in terms of pick-up uh, in connection with that. And I think that uh, there will be that level of encouragement, and I think that will be particularly pertinent uh, as we move into the um, spring term. I think, for example, somebody walking to school, cycling to school, becomes, I suppose from a practical point of view, a more realistic prospect where it's sort of April, May and June time than if you're staring into a cold, wet um, October or November morning. I call Pat Cadney. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, in your statement you talked about the reasons why the notice period you set for schools was missed on this occasion. I had principals call me, I'm sure like many others here, who were looking to the BBC website for information. Can you guarantee that this notice period will be held to in the future? Well, I will try and give the maximum amount of guarantee. I cannot. Um, the problem, I suppose, is twofold. First of all, I cannot guarantee when any paper is, is brought is taken by the executive. Uh, so I can understand the reasons why there was a desire for the wider decisions as regards schools to be taken in the context of the executive review on the 16th. Um, but the initial paper in terms of restarting schools was submitted first to health and then to the task force Friday or Saturday uh, fortnight ago. It was then brought uh, in terms of circulated to executive colleagues uh, a week and a half ago, and then eventually as it was made it to the executive made it for initial discussion of the executive agenda uh, on Thursday and then for final decisions on the Tuesday. So I don't have direct control uh, over that. Uh, I would prefer if those decisions were taken earlier. Uh, but I suppose then you're faced with the choice of either do you put off a return to give greater level of notice or you try to make sure that, that we get our children in as quickly as possible. It is also the case, and I think it's a level of frustration for all of us, um, is that we will quite often see stuff that is either to the uh, executive or to the assembly, which this will make it onto media platforms. I'm restricted in terms of what I can do, in terms of any announcements, in terms of any direct communications. First of all, until the decision is made and until it is made, made public, I can entirely understand the level of frustration that is there amongst uh, sometimes parents, but particularly amongst teachers and staff, that they're seeing this on the media, they're seeing a leak before it reaches that. Uh, I would say and I'm not um, I'm not going to point the finger at anybody within this house, but I noticed, for instance, back in December, I think it was whenever there was a, a statement to the House, some of which outlined the issues regards um, examinations, as it was then, uh, and it was in a position where it was due to be possibly maybe a, a noon or a one o'clock statement, it was then emailed to and round every member. Uh, at about half ten, and within five minutes of that, it was in the media, even though it was embargoed. I couldn't say anything about it yeah. because it was there. So, look, I, and I think, to be fair, I think we've all unfortunately been in that, that position. We're all victims of that. And I think we live in an age where there can be an almost instantaneous news side of things, as long as people get hold of a paper or get hold of that. It's not, it's not helpful. But I think it is, it is difficult to get around a situation where you have to make a public announcement where you can then have that to a large number of people before you actually make that announcement. Supplementary, Pat Catney. Thank you. I have to agree with you, Minister. I realise how difficult the job of all the ministers are and uh, how difficult that is. My supplementary question, Minister, is that um, we know that the schools are the centre of our communities, and um, I'm thinking of uh, little St Colmans in Lambeg in my constituency and how they kept open uh, for the, work, the children of key workers. 
and I notice that you intend to go to your executive in order to look at schemes that can help the children come the summertime. Could you expand on that? Take it in mind, a lot of the children and a lot of the care will relate to mental health. No, I appreciate the member who won't beat the drum for Lambeg uh, on that basis, but the, the scenario clearly is that, that there's a, a wider, I think there's, there's, as I said, there are a number of aspects to this. So it's what directly could be done in school during term time, both in terms of academic and mental health side of things. I think particularly building on what was there last year, I want to see a range of summer schemes made available. Uh, I think that that will be a mixture. I hope that that can be a, a concoction, which means that if, if a school is making availability for some of its pupils and getting funding for that for one week, two weeks, three weeks, depending upon what they're willing to volunteer for, that that would be a mixture over the summer of some academic catch-up, but also, um, you know, I think we've, we've also got to make sure that we're not too harsh on our young people as well. There's a mixture then of fun activities and, and summer activities. Um, so it's about creating that level of mix, and that would be part of a package that I would seek from, uh, from the executive. It's something I'm keen to prioritise as we move ahead, but will require a level of funding from the executive. Can we please bring Stuart Dixon on screen? And can I invite Stuart Dixon to put your question? Uh, thank you, Minister. Minister, on the 1st of February, you jointly announced with the Health Minister a vaccine programme for staff in special schools. Can you tell us today how many of those staff have been uh, vaccinated to date? Well, the position um, in relation to that, there, was, there has been some ongoing discussions with health. As part of that, those were um, staff that have particular relationship with or connection with some clinically vulnerable children who would dealt with that. I think as part of that, that process, it has now been the staff members, the steps were that uh, the children need to be identified and then the staff members that directly relate to them. And I think the number of staff that have been directly identified are they're in the process of getting vaccinated uh, is around about it's just under 700 of those staff um, are now in, within the vaccine programme. For each individual, the opportunity for them to book through that um, is up then to each individual member of staff within that. So I don't, from that point of view, I don't think there's centrally held data over precisely who's where, what, what stage. Uh, I think the precise figure that off the top of my head was something like 686, I think, that, that were made available uh, to that. That's obviously in addition to what would happen elsewhere because there will be, as members are aware, in terms of the vaccine programme, there will be uh, anyone else who's uh, reached a particular age group, which will involve some of the special school staff as well, are obviously separately able to do that, so it will be outside that number as well. Supplementary, Stuart Dixon. Um, thank you, Minister. You recognise the disappointment and indeed the fear and concern amongst many of those staff, because although you've said between six and seven hundred, the reality is that very few, if any, of them have actually had their inoculations uh, so far, and that they are working in extremely difficult circumstances. And indeed, identifying that group has caused further concern for staff who have not been identified, but feel that they are in very similar close proximity to children with special needs. Well, I, I entirely recognise that that was why my proposal to the executive was to have all special school staff vaccinated. However, the executive as a whole uh, took a view that they wanted a consensus with the Department of Health, and that is why Health were reluctant to go down a route in which this was focused in purely at those on specific um, you know, specific job-related side, side of things. This was as far as we could get it directly with health. And I have to follow the position in which the only thing that could get past the executive as a whole was one in which there was an agreement with the Department of Health. So it didn't go as far or as fast as I would have liked it to, but at least we are seeing progress within that. Can we now bring Jerry Carl on screen, please? Can I invite Jerry Carl to put his question? Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I want to pay tribute to all the education workers, but I think the Minister has shown contempt towards them by once again making this decision without any real notice or any time to prepare. Some schools only having up to two working days' notice to make alterations. 
The minister says schools are safe uh, places. I wonder how they're more safe now than they were in December. And how confident is the minister at reopening schools on this scale when such a high proportion of education workers haven't been vaccinated won't lead to, lead to further uh, infections raising? That's why I mean, uh, look, I uh, welcome the thoughts of the, the member. It tends to be as, as positive to me as usual. Um, can I say in, in relation to this, I have indicated that schools themselves, I think, are a very safe environment. That is not simply something that I have said, but if you take a look at the broad analysis that has been there from SAGE and others in terms of expertise, within the school walls, there has tended to be a high level of control, a high level of, of safety. What has been the problem, which has always been indicated with any issue about whether schools are there or not there, is actually around some of the other behavioural impacts that are there whether schools are open or not. So, for example, if we take a look at the issue of primary school children, if you have all primary school children at home, then that, generally speaking, means at least one parent having to be at home with that child. It reduces the level of contact that that adult will have. It will mean the amount of journeys that will take place will be, will be reduced. Uh, any level of interaction, for instance, on, on buses will be uh, reduced. So it has always been part of that, and that has been something which has been highlighted consistently by the medical experts. In terms of the uh, situation uh, as regards the timing of this, it, it, it is also the case where I want to see prioritisation of teachers in terms of vaccination. Any of the level of studies have shown that, at least in terms of as a profession, that education staff uh, are certainly no higher than any other form of staff, which is why I suppose JCVI have taken the particular route that, that they have taken in connection with that. Uh, but you know, I, I think it is important that we do actually um, give that level of support to our young people and to our staff. And anything that has been brought forward, with the mitigations that have been put in place, again, have been ones which have been supported at the executive of the Department of Health. So this is not, uh, as I said, some uh, run on behalf of, of education running against medical advice. This is in line with medical advice. Everything carries a level of risk, but the executive as a whole is very much of the view that we need to prioritise as much as possible our young people and our education. I think that's the right approach. Supplementary, Jerry Carl. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thanks, the Minister, for his um, his answer. But he didn't uh, indicate how schools are safer, uh, more safe now than they were in December. I just want to ask the Minister um, if uh, infections increase uh, in schools. Uh, when uh, they are reopened, uh, will he act? Uh, and what is his baseline for number of new cases uh, per day or per week uh, when he will act to implement measures to possibly close schools down uh, with uh, further uh, rates coming, coming in? You know, I'm constantly amazed by the, the member. Clearly, we will take a look at what the public health situation is. The executive whole wants to prioritise uh, schools. And indeed, if there are issues around infection rates, I think that where that is more likely to be um, pertinent will be around what level of um, what level of other actions then, and how fast we can move other elements of the uh, of the economy and wider society out there. But you know, I have to say, my priority and the executive priority is to support our young people, to keep them in school, to have that face-to-face -face learning for their their benefit, and the rush that the member seems to have. Uh, to want to keep the proletariat ignorant um, strikes me as, as uh, ill-befitting uh, the views of his, of his party. Uh, the default position of trying to keep children out of school should not be one that any of us are adopting. Members, that concludes questions on the statement. And the next item on the agenda is the question of the, of the time, date and place of our next meeting of this committee. We do not yet have a date for our next meeting. I should remind you, however, that the resolution that established this ad hoc committee provided in respect of a time frame that unless the Assembly previously resolves, the committee shall exist for a period of 12 months. Therefore, as things currently stand, the committee shall continue to exist only until the 31st of March 2021. However, the Business Committee has scheduled a motion for consideration at our next plenary sitting, which, if agreed, would extend that time frame by six months. Subject to that motion being agreed, therefore, this committee would be able to continue to meet if required beyond 31st of March. That concludes this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.